before the calm. It's just the storm before the calm. We've been absent from the Gospel of Matthew for some time with the holidays, and I'm glad to be back in the regular routine of studying and uh, teaching from the Gospel of Matthew. And, of course, we read earlier in the verses that we're going to be studying is the 8th chapter, verses 23 to 28. In our text this morning, the Lord and his disciples had gotten into the boat, and they weren't too long in it, and they found themselves in a terrible storm. Now, I know that storms can be very scary, and especially if you're out on a lake in a small boat. I had that happen to me one time, and it was not fun. And uh, I, I have to be honest with you. I knew the Lord is my Savior. I knew if I drowned, I'd be with him in heaven. But I was not looking forward to drowning, so I was a little bit scared. But it happens. To share a story of that, on October the 26th in 1991, the Andrea Gale which was a 72-foot fishing boat, was in the North Atlantic. And their crew had been fishing for swordfish, and they were trying to return to their port back in Massachusetts. When a rare combination of a weather system came together in the North Atlantic to form what would later be dubbed the perfect storm. A weather satellite image taken some weeks later showed that the remnants of what was called Hurricane Grace was swirling together with a polar air mass coming down from Canada, and the results was an explosive storm with recorded winds in the excess of 150 miles per hour. The high, highest waves ever measured at that time was at the height of a 10-story building. And they said with that, with the waves and the winds, the pressure of the water was six tons per square foot of water upon this boat. The Andrea Gale was really never stood a chance against this monster storm. This morning, you may be struggling right now because of difficult circumstances and unfavorable situations that have come together in your life and that you would dub the perfect storm in your life. But rather than talking and discussing the perfect storm this morning, I want to share with you about the perfect storm calmer. His name is Jesus. But I want to begin by asking you a question, and of course I don't want you to answer it, or we'd be here for quite a while, but think about it in your minds and in your hearts. Do you find yourself living in deep concerns, maybe even fear, that things are going to go from bad to worse? Now, instead of living that way, it's my prayer that after this message this morning, that the message will help you change your attitude about this and you will start saying that it's just the storm before the calm instead of the calm before the storm. In this miracle that we're going to look at this morning, there are at least five lessons that you and I can learn. First, Storms rage even when the Lord is in the boat with you or in your boat. All right? Storms still rage. Look at verse 23 of our text in Matthew chapter 8. It says, when he, when Jesus got in the boat, his disciples followed him. The Lord himself gets in the boat and the guys follow him and they get in the boat too. Now let's remember that the Sea of Galilee is actually a freshwater lake about six miles wide and 14 miles long, and according to some, it's about 600 feet below sea level. It's the lowest lake that I've been told on the face of the earth, and the Sea of Galilee is surrounded by tall mountains 
that if you look at it, it would almost look like the Sea of Galilee is down in a funnel. And storms coming through those mountains can roll in at amazing force. Now this morning, I want us to put ourselves in that boat. All right? It's there on the Sea of Galilee. Your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is there. The 12 disciples are there. And you're in that boat too. You ready for the journey? In Mark's gospel, Mark tells us that the journey took place at night. So there were no lights, no, star, no stars to navigate the boat by. Even though some of these disciples were fishermen because of the, the, the violence of the storm, they had to be somewhat, and that was probably a frightening experience. Now, I need to tell you this morning that there are some Christians who make the mistake that they think that because they have the Lord in their lives, because they have accepted Christ as Lord and Savior, that they will be immune from troubles and problems. I'm here to tell you this morning that is not the truth. Even though you are a Christian, you name the name of Christ, your name is written in the Lamb's book of life for all eternity, and the Lord is with you, the storms will still strike. And even though the Lord is in your life, they, you will still encounter storms until the day you go to be with the Lord. There are phys physical storms. There are financial storms. There are emotional storms. There are even relationship storms. And they can strike, and they can strike suddenly. And just because you find yourself in one of those storms, listen, folks, it does not mean that God doesn't love you anymore. It doesn't mean that he's punishing you. The Lord led the disciples into this storm. It says in Matthew's gospel that the Lord got in the boat and the guys, the disciples, followed him. So don't be surprised, beloved, when storms come upon you. Peter tells us over in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 12 this. He starts out, he says, Beloved, what he's trying to do, and I've told you this before, what he's trying to do, he's trying to get your attention. He wants you to quit thinking about what you're going to have for lunch today. He's trying to get you to quit thinking about what you're going to do this afternoon. He wants to draw your attention about what he's going to say to you, and here's what he's going to say to you. He says, Do not be surprised at the fiery ordeals among you, which come upon you for your testing as though some strange thing were happening to you. It's going to happen. It's going to take place. The Word of God isn't a feel-good book about people who lived a perfect life. If that was true, I, I'm not going to talk for you, but I'll talk for myself. If that was true, if the Bible was a, a book, a holy book written by perfect people, I could not relate to it. I don't know about you. Maybe you could. But I couldn't because I'm not perfect. And I don't live a perfect life. It's a volume tracing the lives of hundreds of people who struggle with pain and suffering and yet they maintain their faith in God. But even then, you know what? Some of them, their faith faltered. So if you're one of those believers and your faith has faltered, don't feel like you're the Lone Ranger. It's happened to others in Scripture. Just bounce back and get with other faithful believers. 
Now this morning, there are three kinds of people here this morning and listening to this message this morning. Number one, there are those who have gone through a storm. You've just gone through it. You've weathered it. And maybe you even took a big, deep sigh and you said, Phew, thank you, Lord, that's over. Number two, there are those who are in the middle of the storm, just like the disciples. And everything around you is twirling and swirling around you. Now, if you say, well, I haven't gone through a storm yet. And I'm not in the middle of one. Well, then maybe you're in the third category. There are those who are about to go into the storm. Okay? You're either going into it, you're in the middle of it, or you just got out of it. So don't be surprised when the storms roll into your life. Expect it. Know that they're coming. Number two. Or second, storms create fears that can cause more damage than the actual storm itself. When the dis disciples cried out to the Lord, he said, Why are you afraid, you men of little faith? Now see, the disciples, and sometimes you and I, we fight two storms. And these guys were fighting two storms that night. One was the visible storm on the outside. They saw the waves. They felt the wind. They even saw the water in the waves coming over the boat. But they were also fighting an invisible storm, and that was that storm of fear. And it was raging in their minds and in their hearts. And many times, fear can cause more damage than the thing that you fear yourself. I remember one time I, I had this fear, this inner fear that I was going to die. And I was going to leave my wife and my daughter. And I was going to be dead. Now, I love my wife and my daughter. But then I had to finally come to the conclusion that if I die, as much as I love them to, I'm in a better place. And if they belonged to the Lord, which I knew they did, God would provide for them and meet their needs. So I thought, you dummy, what are you fearing death? If death comes, it means I'm just with Jesus. So I quit fearing. When President Franklin Roosevelt delivered his first inaugural address in 1933, if you've studied history, you'll know that we were in the grips of the Great Depression. We were possibly going to enter another world war. Things did not look good on the home front. And within the first few minutes of his speech, he said this, and I want to quote him. He said, this great nation will endure as it has endured, will revive, and will prosper. And then he continued. He said, so first of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. And then he continued. He said, nameless, unreasoning unjustified terror, and I like this part, he said, which paralyzes. And what does fear do? It paralyzes you, doesn't it? It keeps you from doing that thing that you know God wants you to do, that God has ordered you to do. But when fear creeps in, it paralyzes you from doing that. He went on to say, needed efforts to convert, retreat, and to advance, end of quote. There was truth in his statement. If 
if you're fighting against the storm of fear, let me share with you this morning, and please listen to this. God has a word for you. If you have fear in your life right now, I want to share with you a word from Almighty God. It's found in the book of Isaiah, chapter 41, verse 10. Listen to what is said. He says, do not fear, for I'm with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. Now, he could have stopped there, and that would have been great. Amen? I mean, goodness. God says, do not fear, for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. But he doesn't stop there. He continues. God says, I will strengthen you. Surely, I will help you. Surely, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Beloved, if you have any fear in your life, I want you to highlight Isaiah 41.10 and go home and read it. Read it this afternoon. Read it Monday. Read it Tuesday. Read it for the next week. And live by it. Number three, storms never made the Lord panic. How do you like that one? Storms never made our Lord panic. While the storm was raging, do you know what the Lord was doing? Now, we read it earlier in the text, and I find this great. Jesus, it says himself, was asleep. I love that picture. The waves were crashing in on the boat. It even says that the waves are coming over the boat. They're covering the boat. The wind was howling. The disciples were stressed out, and the Lord was in the back of the boat, and I'm not being disrespectful. The Lord was in the back of the boat snoring away. He was asleep. And what, what do we learn from that? Well, number one, we learn that Jesus' humanity caused him to be so drained from dealing with people that he fell asleep even in a storm. That's the one thing, because if you read the scriptures before that, you found out he was dealing with a lot of people. And let's be honest, when you and I deal with a lot of people every day, every day, every day, every day, it drains us, doesn't it? And sometimes we just want to go home or go into a room and shut the door and just kind of shut our eyes. But the number two thing we need to learn is this, that his deity, who he was, assured him that just because there was a storm out there on that lake, there was no need to panic. Several years ago, I was flying from Texas back home to St. Louis, and somewhere across Arkansas, we flew into a terrible storm. Matter of fact, the, the stewardess and the stewards came around and said, put your drinks down, you know, and throw them in the trash bag and all like that. Bring your seats in the upright position. You know, put your tray tables away and all that good stuff. And even the pilot or the co-pilot said it could be very bouncy, you know, and we apologize and all the good stuff that they say. And I'm looking around, and I see fear on the face of some of the pastors. Now, I'm in the back, and, and, and I'm on the left-hand side of the plane, and the people that are on the right-hand side of the plane, they look out their windows, and I even saw some of them shut the window because they didn't want to look out. It looked bad. But from my position in the plane, I can look out my left-hand side window, and I know they have terminology for that, but I looked out the left-hand side of the, my window, and I looked up, and I could see sunshine. And I knew at the speed that we were flying, it wasn't going to be too long, and we were going to be in the sunshine. 
And so I thought, we're going to be okay. This plane's going to weather it. We're going to be okay. But they didn't see that part. But here's the other thing I discovered, and I was thinking about when I was in that plane. The key of having peace in the, middle, in the midst of a storm is found in being in the Lord. Amen? See, I was in the Lord. All right? I'm a Christian. I've accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior just like you have. And I had a friend of mine tell me many years ago that if you're flying, because I used to, I didn't like to fly. It scared me. It just did. You know, that just didn't make sense to me. You got in this metal box thing and took off, and I know you're going at a high rate of speed, and I know the design of the wings and all that stuff is supposed to lift you up and all that stuff. But, you know, it just didn't make a whole lot of sense. And I talked to this friend of mine, and he said, well, put it this way, Bruce. He said, are you a believer? And I said, well, yes. He said, okay, well, if you die, you're going to go to heaven. He said, but here's the other thing. God has your days on this earth numbered. He said, if that plane goes down before your days are numbered, he said, do you think you're going to die or God's in control and he has your days numbered? He didn't bring out the big eraser and go, oops, made a mistake. Only 58 years instead of 59. He said, no. He said, so even if that plane goes down, he said, if it's not your time, your days allotted by God, he said, even if you're the only one that walks out of that plane, you're going to walk out. Sounds good to me. I didn't worry about it. One, because I didn't know, well, I don't know if my days are numbered then or not. But I said, if they are, well, then I'll just be with the Lord. But see, I was with the Lord. The Lord was in me. So why fear? John chapter 6, verse 33 says this. These things I have spoken to you, so that in me you may have peace. Now Jesus is speaking. He says, in the world you have tribulation, trouble. Headaches, heartaches, whatever else you want to call it. He says, but take courage, I have overcome the world. Now notice something in that verse in 633 of the Gospel of John. Jesus did not say you will have peace. How many of you have accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and since that day until this morning, you've had total peace in your life? If you raise your hand, we need to talk. And you need to confess sin. All right? Because we've all had troubles. Amen? But what he did say was, In me you may have peace. Even in the storms of life, you may have peace being in me. That's what he's saying. And that phrase can help us claim peace even in the midst of a storm. If we are in Christ Jesus. Let me give you an illustration, a biblical illustration of that. Think back. Old Testament. Think back to that guy named Noah. Remember him? Noah built the ark. Everybody knows that. And a storm rose. Big flood. Noah, his family, and the animals are in the ark. Are they safe in the ark? Yeah, they're safe in the ark. Even though the ark was in the midst of a storm and that flood, Noah, his family, and all those animals inside that ark were safe. Let me bring it to us. If you are in Christ, you're a Christian. You will be safe even if you are in a storm because the Lord is in the storm with you. Amen? Amen. Yeah. So why fear? There's no need. Number four. Storms 
force us to cry out to God for help. Now, let's remember. Let's go back. You're still in the boat, right? There's Jesus. He's back there sleeping. You got Peter, James, and John, and all the rest of them up there, the 12, and you're there in the boat with them. Remember that some of these disciples were fishermen. And they had grown up on this lake, fishing it in what? Boats. And they probably did everything they could to, dis to survive the storm. They trimmed the sails. They turned maybe the boat into the wind. And maybe some of them who weren't fishermen, maybe they started bailing. You need those guys too. And finally, they get to the point that is called P-O-T-D. P-O-T-D, the point of total desperation. Okay? They give up. These fishermen have done all that they know how to do. The guys that are bailing are just bailing that because that's all they know to do. And they finally give up. And they cry out, Lord, save us. We're perishing. Lord, save us. We're going to drown. That's a prayer. And that's a very simplistic prayer. It wasn't some flowery prayer. It was just straight to the point. Lord, save us. Maybe you're in a storm right now that you're at the POTD point where you just cry out to God and say, Lord, save me. I don't know what to do next. That's when the Lord steps in. You should have cried that out at the very beginning and not waited. Amen? Now, most of us, we'd rather avoid the storm altogether. I'm sure Peter and James and John and those guys would have too. But see, hear, hear me out. God allows storms to come in our lives, in your life, in my life, for the same reason that he did in Peter, James, and John, and Andrew, and all the rest of them. And that was to teach them, and it's to teach us that he is powerful enough to calm the storms in your life. And he's probably got you going through a storm to teach you something about yourself and about him. Now, most of us who've read our Bible knows Romans chapter 10 and verse 13. That verse says, For whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, most of us think that that only applies to your initial salvation experience, right? That's what we share with people. But that is a promise not just dealing with the initial salvation plan. That is a promise that we can claim daily every time we find ourselves in a storm of suffering and we can call upon the name of the Lord to save us and to deliver us. How do you like that? Another verse to write down. Romans 10, 13. Listen to what that sweet singer of Israel, David, wrote over in Psalm 34, verses 17, 17 and 18. He says, The righteous cry, and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Let me ask you a second question this morning. Do you qualify? Is your heart broken or is your spirit crushed? 
then listen to me. Call upon the Lord. Call upon the Lord and He will deliver you from your troubles. Now, it doesn't mean that He's going to make them go away. But He will deliver you from your troubles. He will see you through it. But you have to call upon the name of the Lord. Amen? Now, the fifth lesson. And I like this. Storms still surrender to the power of God. That's a powerful God. Amen? What kind of storm? Any storm. They still surrender to the power of God. Look at our text, Matthew chapter 8. Look down at verse 26. And he said to them, he looks at his disciples, they wake him up, finally getting some rest. Remember, you're in the boat. Jesus has been dealing with all kinds of people with all kinds of problems, and he's kind of worn out because let's remember, he's human, right? And he lays back in the back of the boat and he falls asleep. And you wake him up. You're part of the crowd that wakes him up. And he said to them, why are you afraid, you men of little faith? After it says, he says that the Bible tells us, Matthew tells us, then he got up and look what he did. He rebuked the winds and the sea, and it became perfectly calm. It doesn't tell us which of the disciples, or if it was all of them as a big group yelling out, but one of the disciples maybe went and cried out, Lord, save us, we're drowning. And he's laying back there. Have you ever been woken up out of a sleep by somebody doing something like that? Phone rings? I remember when I was young and at home, every day my grandmother called me to see how I was doing. And one day my job took me well into the wee hours of the morning. Got home, crawled into bed. Grandmother was retired. She didn't have to work. She got up early. I'm talking like 4 a.m. to read her Bible and pray. And she calls me about 5.30. She says, what were you doing? And that's how she, when I picked up the phone, she didn't even wait till uh, hello or even stumbling trying to say hello. What are you doing? I said, I don't know. I had to answer the phone. She went smart aleck and hung up. Then I couldn't go back to sleep, so I called Grandma. But that startledness, have you ever been there? I can imagine the Lord. What? He's waking up from the sleep. What? You're going to drown. No, you're not going to drown. Why not? A storm calmers in the boat. See, when they got in the boat, he didn't say, let's go and get in the middle of the lake and drown. He wanted to go to the other side. Amen? And I can imagine the Lord moving to the side of the boat, standing up. The fierce wind off that lake is whipping through his hair. Lightning is flashing around him. Thunder is crashing. Maybe even at this point, the water that's pounding waves over the boat has soaked his clothes. And in Mark's gospel, Mark records that the Lord uses a word that a parent would use to reassure a troubled child. And a good translation is this. Hush. Now calm down. How many of us as parents have done that to our kids when they were little and they've awoken from a bad dream 
and you've gone in there. And you've said, hush, it's okay now. Calm down. That's what the Lord was saying. And the storm vanished instantly. The Word of God says that it became perfectly calm. Now, I know some of you may think, well, Pastor, listen, all storms eventually end. They all do at some point. But what I want you to see this, and the point of the, this miracle is this, is the suddenness of the calm. In a flash, the wind, the rain was gone, and the water was as smooth as glass. All because of what the Lord said. Look at verse 27 of our text. Now these guys have been around him for a while. Okay? Peter, James, and John, and, and, and all the rest of them, they've been around him. And when they saw this in verse 27, it says, And the men were amazed and said, What? kind of man is this? And that's a question that I believe each person must answer for themselves. What kind of man is this Jesus? Who is he? Well, if you believe he is the creator of the winds and the sea and everything else, and you believe that all he has to do is say, hush to the storm, and you'll find the same calm that the disciples experienced and that you're in Him. You're in the boat with Him. In my 21 years of the ministry and 47 years as a Christian, I've seen hundreds, hundreds of Christians go through times of pain and stress, and yet many of them possess a sense of peace and calm. that I would describe as being beyond human understanding. And you've seen them too. You may have been one of them. Where it seemed like the perfect storm was upon you. And to the human point of view, there was no way out of this. You were going to drown, according to the experts. But you're going through life with perfect peace and calm in your life. How can that be? Philippians 4, verse 7. And the peace of God, being in God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I see some people, and you've seen them too, they've gone through one struggle in their life after another. And you think, my goodness gracious, how can they do it? But they just plow ahead. And they have perfect peace and perfect calm in their life. It's because they are in Christ, they, are no, they know they're in Christ, and they know God is in control, and that He is sovereign, and nothing is going to happen to them that's not out of his control. And they can go through life, even though life's circumstances may say it's terrible. They're going through life with their eyes focused on God, knowing that whatever happens is in his control. And they have peace and calm. And I thank God for them. And we need to be like that. Amen? Well, let me leave you with this. In the midst of this storm on the Sea of Galilee, the disciples forgot one thing. They forgot the Lord was in the boat with them, the Creator. And they forgot, like I mentioned earlier, that Jesus said, let us go to the other side. Now, I'm of the firm belief, beloved, when Jesus said, let's go on over to the other side, 
no devil, no demon, no armies of Caesar, no storm was going to sink that boat. They were going to go to the other side. In your life, in mine, we might be going through a storm. But see, we're going to go to the other side too, are we not? This world is not my home, the old song says. I'm just passing through. My home, your home, if you are in Christ, is heaven. And I don't care what the storm is, beloved. When God said to you, you're going to go on the other side, no devil, demon, no army of anybody's or nothing is going to sink your boat till you get to the other side. The Lord has promised his followers, followers that we will make it through the storm. Paul the Apostle writes in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6 this. He says, For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it into the day of Christ Jesus. Paul says, I've got all the confidence in the world. Who began a good work in you, beloved? God did. And he's going to see it all the way through to the day that you go to be with the Lord. If the disciples had just trusted his word, they would not have been afraid of drowning. Now, here's the application for you and me. If you don't hear anything else that I've said this morning, beloved, I hope you, I hope you remember this. Okay? When the Lord is in your boat, when you are in Him, you're going to make it to the other side. You're going to make it. No matter what the storms of life are, you will make it. So, how are you living your life? Afraid of the storms? Fearful of the storms? Crying out to God, Lord, save us, I'm about to drown? Or are you knowing in your heart that you are in God and you are going to make it to the other side? Beloved, if you're in the middle of the storm, it's just the storm before the calm. Not the calm before the storm. And God will see you through. Whatever it is. Now if God has been speaking to you about your thinking about life and storms and fear and all like that, like I said, know this, that with you being in the Lord and the Lord is in your boat, you're going to make it to the other side. If the Lord's been speaking to you, I want you to stop before we say the prayer and you speak to him. Because, see, when you're fearing the storm, you're having little faith in God. When you fear, what you're saying is God is not aware and he's not good enough and he's not smart enough to know what's best for you. So I have to fear it. Mm -mm. God's all-knowing. God's all-powerful. Beloved, listen. If these were ever my last words to you, God is in control. And if you don't believe that in your heart fully, 100%, then I pray and I ask that you pray to God and you ask Him to change your thinking. Because all you're going to do is be a Christian that's living a defeated life. And that's about as wrong as the day is long. So let's go to the Lord in prayer silently for ourselves and then I'll lead us in prayer. Let's pray.
Father God, we come to you. And we ask, Father, that you forgive us of our sins of living a life of fear. Of living a life of thinking that it's just going to get worse. Of thinking a life that if anything bad is going to happen to somebody, it's going to happen to me. Father, that is fear. That is lack of faith. And that is a sin. And Father God, I pray for all of us that if we have that in our lives, that we confess it as sin, we ask that you forgive us of that sin, and we advance and move ahead. Because you are God, and we are in you, and you are in us. And when you and, and, and when we are together, we will make it on the other side because we're in the boat with Creator God. Father, speak to our hearts and lead us and guide us and direct us as only you can. We love you. We praise you. Help us to apply Isaiah 41.10 to our lives this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's stand together and take your hymnal. Turn to page 310. Out of my bondage, sorrow, and night. Jesus, I come. Jesus, I come. If the Lord is speaking to your heart, listen. Don't think, oh, I'll take care of it later. No, you won't. I know human nature. I know me. You won't take care of it later. You let the Lord take care of it right here, right now. All right? If God is speaking to your heart, you obey Him and you obey Him promptly and do as He has called you to do as we sing.